Today I'm going to give you um, a little bit of um, uh, history on our industry. And of course, given the time limit, everything will be in summary form. And then we'll cover a little bit on why Africa, since this was, has been discussed um, a lot over the last few days, um, we'll skip through this fairly quickly and get to where we are today as an overview in private equity in Africa, as well as I'll give you one of the benchmarks. There's been a lot of talk about data, and there actually is a lot of data. So I'll present a little bit of this and, uh, and leave you with some summary thoughts. Now, everything that I bring up, of course, can be and will be discussed more in detail in the panel that follows under the very able leadership of Dorothy, so we can continue with our discussions then. So private equity started in South Africa in the mid-90s and in the rest of Africa in the late 1990s. The industry was started by the development finance institutions, by the IFCs, CDCs, DEGs, FMOs of the world, and um, that makes us somewhat unique uh, because it's an industry that is very much for profit, most of the industry, and, um, and a very commercial industry with strong returns, but it has a focus simultaneously on ESG and development impact. And uh, one of the things we're getting ready to do in Af Africa is measure that for the whole industry. In other words, while we are trying to get 30% plus IRRs three times our cash on cash, what is the impact of doing that actually on development of Africa? And hopefully we'll have that someday soon. Um, in the early days, fundraising was very difficult and we very much needed the DFIs without whom the industry would have started, but maybe five to 10 years later. It's becoming much easier to raise money. In our own fund, we have very classic private equity, private sector investors, pension funds, endowments, fund of funds, sovereign now, um, from virtually everywhere in the world. Of course, most of private equity funding is from the US, as is ours, but there's also European investors and elsewhere. In Africa, we like to say that by the time an industry gets to Africa, we, it has developed virtually everywhere else in the world. And so by the time it gets to Africa, we've learned from the mistakes made in other parts of the world, and the industry develops really quickly. And this has been true from cellular to private equity. We have developed very quickly, and that continues. Why Africa? And again, this has been discussed, but Africa has three major things, and there's several listed here. But um, the major ones I'll point out is it is a very big market. It has um, not only a large GDP, but it's also got a large consumer base. And so while the GDP and population, for instance, is the same as in India, consumption is, in Africa is actually higher than in India. So, and second thing is it's a very fast-growing uh, continent. In the late 2008, 2009, 2010, it was the fastest-growing continent in the world, barring none. And you'll see some of the fastest-growing countries historically and projected in the future are in Africa. And Africa, of course, has been blessed with quite a few resources, which helps push the whole economy and the growth up. One of the key trends of the investment opportunities in Africa are there is a transforming landscape. You have, and we have discussed this in the last few days, so I won't spend time on it, except to say that the economic reforms and the liberalization, privatization, has brought an energy to Africa like in other emerging markets. But in Africa, we see every day on the ground countries competing for capital. So the idea that something will be nationalized, except maybe for the very, very large $20, $30 billion oil fields, which are not nationalized, but there's a discussion as to sharing of value. But below that, which is all of us in private equity, there is, we don't worry about that. And that energy of liberalization has created a strong middle class. Again, more than 300 people, a third of the population, same as in India, but the consumption is higher in this middle class. And coming out of that has been fast growth and has been numerous investment opportunities. One of the things I get asked is, where is the industry on exits? Because exits have been hard and um, far uh, between exits and other EM. So what I will say is that personally, and this is my 15th year of private equity in Africa, 
and our fund is just crossing over a billion in AUM. So we have been around. We have not, in previous funds, current funds, we have um, three exits. Um, one that will be paid next week, one that's done a partial exit, another one that's we're in the middle of. We haven't had issues exiting. There are stock exchange exits. There are 24 stock exchanges in general. There's increasing depth in the stock exchange. You know, the Johannesburg stock exchange is over 900 billion. But the other stock <coughs> exchange, Nigeria, Morocco, Kenya, while they have not been as high as they were in 2007 and 8, <coughs> they are still viable for smaller companies. But I'd like to point out the last few bullet points here. Um, first one is that London Stock Exchange is a very viable exit. Today in London, we can dual list our companies and there the, um, we can raise capital markets debt. There's a huge demand for Africa paper, which is consumer based. And we get pitched by investment banks almost every day. This was not the case five years ago. It wasn't even the case two years ago. So therefore, the viability of, of in, um, exiting on stock exchanges is increasing. At the same time, there is data out there for this. AFCA has um, data on at least four exits so far. We are actually about to announce two on top of the uh, 14, and I think there's other exits going on in other PE funds. The Ernst & Young study, which again is available through AFCA, looked at 118 exits in Africa and basically showed the viability of good companies in exiting. So most of the exits came from strategics, but there was also some listings and uh, sales on the stock exchanges. And on the strategics, there is increased interest from um, investment banks all over Africa, which also is leading to increased interest from strategics from around the world. We have had more strategic investors look at our companies and cold call us, as well as come to us and say, how do we invest in Africa together? More in the last year than the previous 14 years, and this is increasing. So where are we today in African PE? African P is definitely standing on two feet. Um, again, according to AFCA data, there's over 140 PE firms. 46 of these were included in the Cambridge Associates benchmarking exercise. What does that mean? That there's at least 46 PE funds that are institutionalized and have the sort of data that Cambridge can rely on. There's over 28 billion of AUM and at least 10 billion that's very much verified through Cambridge Associates. There's $3.2 billion invested in 53 PE deals in 2013, and to date, $1.4 billion raised so far in 2014. A little snapshot of African PE in last year. This year's numbers obviously were not through the year. Deals by region, you'll see there are deals throughout the region. West Africa, a little more than the rest of the region. Our fund is Pan-African, and we in Fund 1, ADP 1, we had equal distribution of deals throughout Africa in all of the investable countries in all of the regions of Africa. The total number of deals by country, you'll see there's still significant deal flow in the larger countries, Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya. Morocco for us is one of the biggest countries also for deal flow and deals that we have within our fund already. You'll see the total number of deals by sector and one of the key things here is that every year we find there are more investable sectors. In ADP1, for instance, our own fund, as a proxy, um, we had deals in pharmaceuticals, housing, um, insurance, banking, consumer credit, manufacturing. What we didn't have is what we did the first two deals in our second fund, ADP2. First deal was in education, tertiary education in universities. Second deal was in logistics one of the bigger logistics companies in Southern Africa. So every year we find more deals. So the question asked about Africa, are there companies out there? Are there investable industries? Can the funds be diversified? I think that's been more than enough factually answered. Deal value by size, you'll see that um, there are a lot of smaller deals, but there's also some very large deal. We invest in the 20 to 100 million and there is no shortage of deal flow. In fund one, we looked at 510 deals to invest in nine companies. In fund two, we've already looked at, we've been investing for about a year. 
So we have already looked at more than 250 companies. We've done two deals. There is no shortage of deals. In fact, there's more deals that we see every month. Deal value by investment stage, and you'll see there is, there is a uh, diversity, but really it is the, um, the growth capital, as we'll discuss in a minute also, and um, some of the more mature companies. But you know that was true in Europe also until about seven to 10 years ago. Okay, I put up this slide just again to show you how many industries um, are investable. So the one on the left, the pie chart on the left, is the industries that were in our first fund. The one on the right is all the ones that are in our pipeline. So some of those industries, we wait for a number of years until there's some maturity in the companies, and we know that the companies are profitable and have a good track record. But there's more and more investable industries coming along. A little bit about GP strategies. Um, on the geographic focus, we're Pan-African, but they're very good funds who are regional funds and also country-specific funds. In the country-specific funds, the ones with the most track record and most number of funds are, of course, South Africa and Nigeria. But they're good funds in Egypt, in Morocco, and other parts of Africa. On the right, you'll see the type of investment strategy. Most of us are growth investors. There's been very little debt available in Africa, outside of South Africa and some of the larger countries in North Africa. While that's changing, what is that has meant is that our IRR's returns come out of simple growth in the companies, and we have companies that, have, that are growing at 100% a year. A low growth company for us is 10 to 15% growth. There are some efficiencies, and whenever we can, we do put in debt, and that allows us to underwrite 30% 3x. Growth is what, what I see most of my peers in private equity investing in. There's buyout, mostly in South Africa, but also South African companies are often hybrid investors, where they will do growth deals as well as buyout deals, and of course there's debt available in South Africa. There are a number of SME funds, some new impact funds, some very large and raising money in a good clip real estate funds, and then the other specialties and more specialties coming. So far, Africa's been a bit nascent, so in terms of develop, um, deal flow and specialization. So there are more generalist funds than there are specialty funds, but of course, as the market um, uh, matures, there'll be more specializations. A little bit about re uh, returns and benchmarking, and this, of course, is the important slide. This data is from Cambridge Associates, and they have they've sliced and diced it in many different ways, and we'll have on our panel next someone from Cambridge Associates if you want them to slice and dice and give more data. But what this shows is having now a fairly good group of 46 funds and more than 10 years of track record, African general PE um, IRR is around 11.6%. Now that compares very favorably, because remember every five years this rejiggers itself and some region does better and some region does worse, but Africa is among the higher ones and um, is a very respectable return. The net multiple of 2.2 um, for 96.98, again, is a very good uh, return because depending on fund size and clip of investment, that is close to a 3x um, for the industry, which is extraordinary. It's been down um, uh, 1.3 certain years, but I think part of that is you don't have a full cycle, and it's looking at um, quarterly valuations rather than full exits, and we value um, our quarterly valuations using European venture capital guidelines very conservatively. We have one deal now where we are at a written offer of 3.2 times our cash on cash cost. We've carried it over the years at 1.5. So that will change as we get into the future, that 1.3. And again, a net IRR of 19% and the 9.2 I think will also change. Now of course, this doesn't tell you what the top decile is. And many funds in Africa are doing a whole lot better than this. My last fund before ADP1, um, we did a 37% net IRR, 2.4 net uh, cash on cash, which says higher than, um, obviously higher than 30% IRR gross and higher than three times gross on cash on cash. ADP1 is very much set to do this. Our exits are 40s IRR when we average the three, and um, uh, gross is very close to 3x. So, 
we have data out there, and there are performing funds out there. A little bit on the risks, because obviously, um, to be realistic, in Africa, as, we're, as well as every other part of the world, we have risks. Anybody who thinks private equity is easy or glamorous has not been in private equity anywhere in the world. In Africa, we are looking at currency risk. I know that you know everywhere in EM, currency has been a big issue last year, a little less so this year. In our own portfolio, the currency hit is around, depending on time period, 10 to 20%, but the growth has been way more than this. So while we worry about currency, it really only becomes a worry if you have to exit when you're in a down market. So South Africa, the currency is off 50% from its highs. Ghana, it's now getting to 60, 70%. And so you don't want to exit your companies today in those markets if you don't have to. Sometimes you want to because you have outsized growth and you have outsized uh, multiples, entry multiples bid by the buyer. But that's when it matters the most. And of course, currency risk comes very much out of macro risk. And while Africa as a whole has been very stable, and you saw that when the rest of the world was running to the IMF in 2009, 2010, 2011, we had very few problem countries in Africa. In fact, no problem countries in the way that um, existed in Europe and the US at that time. Macro is still stable. There are a few countries that are off the macro, mostly because governments have overspent but let's see what happens over time. We do have 54 countries, and one or two are having experiencing problems, not the rest of them. There is sovereign risk. Nobody predicted Arab Spring that I know of. Nobody predicted when things went south in Cote d'Ivoire, and that's why we choose to be a Pan-Africa fund with diversification. But if you look at the 54 countries in Africa, there's been very little of this. Also, we hear about uh, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, but again, this has not affected the growth and the performance of our companies, and that's really what we care about. Ebola, we hear yesterday that the World Health Organization, the UN, has said that um, Ebola cases may be up to 500,000, but again, Nigeria seems to have done a good job of you know, keeping it under control, and this has not affected the growth of our companies or our travel plans for that matter. So we worry about it. It hasn't done anything to our returns yet. We are waiting also for a rebound in several markets. In Africa, the downturns in the stock markets, which with it take the valuations of the companies, are severe. They can be down 70% from its highs and stay there for four or five years. And it's important to remember that as private equity because Buying at a good price is very important to exiting in any environment, and we do have time limits, and so we do have to worry about that. There are other risks, but these are some of the major ones. Sorry, I, I didn't put up the slide there, so here are the things that I talked about. But African PE is an attractive asset class. There's low private equity penetration in Africa relative to other regions. So I've been comparing Africa, which is 54 countries, to South Asia. Even if you take India, not the other countries in South Asia. There is a um, similar number of people, similar GDP, many fewer private equity funds. When we go out and we look at companies, we don't have competition. We don't see the other presumably 139 PE funds. We just I don't know where they are. Um, the few times we've combined with other PE funds, that happens everywhere else in the world, and we have co-investors who are other PE funds, but we have not had pricing bid up because of this. Our pricing in fund one, high growth portfolio spitting out a lot of cash, average pricing was 4.4 EV EBITDA. Where do you get that for highly profitable, best of class companies, the blue chips of Africa? So it's still been very uncompetitive in terms of finding companies, as long as you're well networked in, the, in, the, in Africa. There have been attractive returns for private equity versus other asset classes. I'll leave this to the panel to discuss, but when we've compared PE in Africa over the same 10 years as listed, PE has outperformed. Now, there may be a year that the stock exchanges go up, as happened in the US, 70% up. That year, 
Obviously, PE is not competitive, but we are a longer-term asset class. Over 10 years, the returns have been better. The other thing that I will point out on this point is that if you look at the Nigerian stock exchange, and it's true in a many other stock exchanges, 60 to 70 percent of the stock exchange is financial institutions. Where are the manufacturing companies? Where are the pharmaceutical companies? Where are you know, any of the other companies? They're still private. And that's what we can access. So it's a huge part of the African economy that is not yet listed. And they will list someday because um, when we're in, we encourage them to list. But we're not there yet. So um, limited competition, low correlation of African markets with the rest of the world. Most of the LPs who come in to our fund are looking as much for return as they are from diversification. So Africa tends to be very delinked from the rest of the world. Not so for South Africa, obviously, and sometimes Egypt, but the rest of the continent, currency, various other things don't move t together, and neither does private equity investments. And so there is a, there is a bit of a hedge there, and um, that is important to find out. The general themes that I talked about, high growth economies, um, more investable, high growth industries everywhere, very, very well-run, high-growth, well-managed companies, and increase in the amount of debt, which, of course, we can get higher IRRs from. All these reasons are why we, so far, have been able to give good returns. And I think, from what I can see, that is actually getting better. We should be able to get better in this. So, And now there's African benchmarking and PE, which is what pension funds and everyone else does need to go to their investment committees, and that is now available. In conclusion, private equity has matured. We're standing on two feet. There are risks, but they're offset by a compelling opportunity, and the industry continues to grow. Thank you very much.